Ladies and gentlemen, I am the uh, Secretary General of Estonia's Foreign Ministry, Jonathan Sebev. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here in Tallinn for the 15th Lennart Meri Conference. I was told it's the 15th time we're having this event. It's going to be a great event. They always are. And um, 
I'm uh, pretty certain that uh, one idea will be repeated throughout this conference. I at least hope it, it will be repeated. Uh, all of the foreign guests here, some of them at least, will come uh, up the, to the stage and compliment Estonia. And they will uh, tell you all that Estonia is a country that punches above its weight. And we will enjoy it. On top of this being a good, provocative uh, event, this is an event that gives us such pleasure because you will all be coming here and complimenting us, punching above our weight. We're a small country. We like this compliment. Poland, however, is a big country. It is a big country by European standards. In our Nordic Baltic region, Poland is a superpower. The populations of uh, all Nordic Baltic eight countries combined is roughly equal to that of Poland. And yet Poland, too, punches above its weight, especially when it comes to European security issues. It has been especially clear over the past 12 months when Poland first uh, had to deal with the hybrid attack, the um, instrumentalization of migration that uh, Lukashenko directed against Europe. It was Poland who had to carry the weight of Europe. When uh, Europe was discussing collective defense within NATO, it was Poland that led these discussions politically. Today, Poland is leading Europe in rapidly increasing defense spending. And right now, in the context of the war against Ukraine, a war that affects all of us, it is Poland that is leading in assisting Ukraine. It is Poland that is leading in the discussions on raising the cost of aggression. It is Poland that is leading NATO in strengthening collective defense again. A country that, while big, still punches above its weight. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce a man who needs no introducing. Doesn't need introducing here in Estonia, in the Nordic Baltic region, region, doesn't need introducing anywhere in Europe. I am honored to hand the floor over to the president of Poland, Mr. Duda, Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind words. <laughs> Mr. President, Madam President, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to open this panel of the 15th Leonard Merritt Conference. I understand its main topic is the role of multilateral organizations, the OSCE in particular, in ensuring peace and security. Certain interpretation of the title could suggest that the organization after 50 years of activity should leave the international stage, should simply roll over and make space for other to rock if we are to stick to the metaphor used in title. However, Experience teaches that certain rock and roll bands, particularly those from Europe, can display amazing vitality and popularity even after half a century in show business. As the old proverb says, a rolling stone gathers no moss. And history teaches that are simply no alternatives to international organization older than the OSCE, like the UN, NATO, or the European ones. In spite of what the proponents of the Warsaw Pact or the Euro-Asian Union believe, Poland, the current OSCE's chair, believes that there is just no time to die neither for OSCE, nor for the UN, NATO, or the EU. But we recognize that maintaining or increasing their vitality and popularity requires just as in a rock band commitment from all the members, commitment 
to their purposes, principles, and aims. And the resulting responsible constructive efforts to accomplish their goals in accordance with their founding documents, be it the Charter of the United Nations, the North Atlantic Treaty, the OSCE key documents, or the EU treaties. Ladies and gentlemen, the said organization should help ensure peace and security, including in Eastern Europe. Poland will continue to strive towards this end. We will continue to call on others to do the same. We will also encourage relevant adaptation to raise the effectiveness of our joint actions. We should act within the UN. I'm pleased that Poland enjoyed excellent cooperation with Estonia in the Security Council, whose reform we support. At the UN, we need to cooperate with all partners, including the incoming members of its various bodies. For instance, Poland looks forward to working closely with Czech Republic at the Human Rights Council, where it has recently replaced the Russian Federation. We look forward to cooperating with a partner who respects its own human rights obligations. Instead of a state displaying total contempt of, for human rights, both domestically and abroad, which is one of the key features of the Ruski Mir, Russia tries to spread or impose on others. We should continue to work towards upholding international law, including the fundamental principles of the UN Charter, such as respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, non-interference in the internal affairs of other states, peaceful settlement of international disputes. We need to step up efforts aimed at ensuring respect for international humanitarian law and human rights law, support for investigating and prosecuting those responsible for the most serious crimes, accountability for the crime of aggression, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. That's why Poland supports Ukraine and the International Criminal Court in investigating Russian crimes in Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, we should act at NATO. Poland will continue to work closely with partners, including from the alliances Bucharest 9, to strengthen the transatlantic cooperation and NATO's security, defense, and deterrence in particular in its eastern flank, due to the fundamental change of the security and military situation in Ukraine, but also in Belarus. We need to continue our efforts to that end in the run-up to NATO's Madrid summit in June, but also beyond, including by reinforcing the capabilities and readiness of our troops. Their additional deployments training and exercise, and keeping NATO's door open to all those who are willing and able to join. Ladies and gentlemen, all participating states should act at the OSCE with the understanding that the very foundations of security and ability in Europe and beyond have been shaken by the Russian aggression on Ukraine, with which Belarus has supported. Russia has violated all the fundamental rules of the Helsinki Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe Final Act of 1975, the Charter of Paris for a New Europe of 1990, the Istanbul Document of 1999, and the Astana commemorative declaration towards a security community of 2010. This marks the end of the European security system built after the Cold War as we knew it. 
We must adapt and adjust to the new situation. It holds true also the, for the OSCE. It is the only institutional platform for discussion on the European security with the participation of Russia and other states of the former Soviet Union. That's why Poland's presidency will continue to do its best to keep the armed aggression on Ukraine on top of the organization's ag agenda. In spite of Russia's effort to achieve the opposite, as its actions regarding to the OSCE special monitoring mission to Ukraine have clearly demonstrated. We need to exert political and diplomatic pressure on Russia, counteract its propaganda, and help document its crime. Unfortunately, its repeated rejection of the West's offer to build a common security architecture was misinterpreted by many for a long time. For years, they believed in the possibility of some kind of the partnership. They hoped that by developing joint projects with Russia, such as Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, cooperation and change in its behavior could be achieved. Today we know that these were naive illusions at best, illusions that have had the most serious consequences, including for Ukraine. Russian activity, also at the OSC, proved for years that Russia was never interested in cooperation with the West, but in undermining it. Its constant obstruction, be it with regard to the modernization of the Vienna document or the discussion on conventional armed forces in Europe, are just two pieces of evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, all member states need to act in the EU. Recognizing that we might be looking ahead to many months of struggle and sacrifice. That's why Poland continues to call for a policy of pressure on Russia and solidarity with Ukraine. No matter how long and hard the road may be, with the EU at the forefront of its effort, shoulder to shoulder with partners from across the Atlantic and from other parts of the world. It should include providing adequate resources both to Ukraine and to Ukrainian refugees who found safe home in other countries. That's why Poland and Sweden have recently organized in Warsaw an international donors conference for Ukraine. That's why we continue to call for the much needed current support and for thinking about ways to rebuild Ukraine's infrastructure destroyed by Russia. Why we, why we also call for maintaining European perspective for Ukraine, but also Moldova, Georgia, and other states outside the EU willing and, and able to join it. That is why we repeat that after Russia stops the attack, there should be no return to business as usual with Moscow, no matter how much it may cost some of us. Russians must be immediately and entirely cut off from profiting from the aggressive war they waged on Ukraine. And those complicit need to face all consequences of their acts, including compensation for the damage they caused. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I have been informed that the Leonard Mary Conference was conceived in 2007 to provide a forum for finding solutions to Europe's foreign and security policy challenges. I'm sure that the insights shared by the distinguished speakers of its current edition will contribute to their identification. Also with regard to multilateral organizations, including the OSCE. 
The panel's title inspired me to include rock music references in my introduction. Let me also finish with one. The king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, famously called for a little less conversation, a little more action. But I think, but I think we need both. So I wish and hope for interesting conversations here in Tallinn that will inform actions also elsewhere. I thank again the organizers for the invitation and all participants for your kind attention. Thank you very much and have a good time and efficient time in Tallinn. Thank you. And if I may now ask the first panel to join me on the stage. Um, Madam President, then I would like Jurgi, Lolita, Piotr, and Mike on the far end. President Duda referred to Elvis Presley the moment he mentioned his name. <laughs> Another song came to my mind, it's uh, Suspicious Minds. <laughs> Suspicious Minds, my favorite uh, Presley song, and this event is going to be based, in, <laughs> if I have any say uh, on this, on Suspicious Minds. We um, will not be discussing rock and roll. We'll be discussing not just the OSC at 50, uh, but uh, cooperative security as a concept, and its role in Europe today and uh, in the future. Uh, Arguably, European security architecture has been built on three main pillars, at least for the last roughly 50 years. The European Union was conceived as a project for peace, to integrate European economies, the economies of European democracies, so that war between them would become impossible. It has been a successful project for peace. NATO has provided for the military defense of uh, democracies on our continent. And at least since 1975, we've always had this third pillar of cooperative security based on the core principles uh, outlined in the Helsinki Final Act and other documents. Principles that are very basic, very basic, but upon which everything else in this cooperative security pillar was built, from the OSC as an organization to arms control to confidence building measures. This uh, pillar has been in crisis before. It has seen various challenges. I would argue that uh, the crisis it is facing today is more significant than anything that it has faced. Um, I read the Helsinki Final Act in order to prepare for today, and it struck me that Russia is in violation not of some of the principles, but of all of them questioning the very legitimacy of the existence of another participating state, questioning the very legitimacy of the existence of Ukraine as not only a country, but of a nation. A crisis unlike anything cooperative security has seen. This panel is here to discuss whether I'm right or wrong, whether the problem that cooperative security faces is as serious as it seems to me. We will also be discussing what to do about it. And we will be discussing the OSC as an organization that is 50 years old. We'll be discussing whether it's too old to rock and roll, and perhaps too young to die. The panel that we have is the best one that we could have, uh, the best one that anyone can have. And as we're people on the stage, I mean, we're all at least part-time, we're actors here for your benefit. So actors play your roles. And I have given each one of the panelists a role that is simplifying their actual role in European politics. First, we have the president of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, who represents the body that represents 500 million Europeans. She is the European on our panel. 
We have Jyrki Katainen, former Prime Minister, Finance Minister Vice, uh, of Finland, Vice President of the European Commission. He gets to be the Finn on the panel. <laughs> we have uh, Lolita Tsigane, former Chair of the European Affairs Committee of the Parliament of Latvia, a former journalist, a thinker. She gets to be the Latvian on the panel. Piotr Burash is the head of European Council of Foreign Relations, Warsaw Office, and a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. He is the think tanker. And last but not least, Ambassador Mike Carpenter is the permanent representative of the United States. The OSC has had uh, prior positions uh, at the Pentagon. Uh, lastly, was uh, leading the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement. He does not get to be the American. He gets to be the official, <laughs> the only one on the panel who actually works at the OSC today. Um, one short administrative note. I will ask each panelist to uh, give us a few ideas in a few minutes. Um, I'll ask each of them a question, and then I'll open it up so that you could participate as suspicious minds in this discussion that is most relevant concerning the time we're in. But first, Madam President, uh, Roberta, you visited Kiev last month, um, and you gave a powerful speech as a representative of the people of Europe to the parliament of Ukraine. And if I read your speech correctly, you framed the war against Ukraine not only as a war against Ukraine, but as a war against the values that we, as Europeans, uh, hold dear. Uh, could you please open this discussion up by giving us a little bit of context, telling, uh, commenting on the significance of this war beyond Ukraine, which is self-evident. What is the significance of this Ukraine, uh, of this war against Ukraine? for Europe, the European Union, and European security architecture writ large. So thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'll, I'll start also by reflecting a little bit on its title. And I, as I was coming in, I started to, to think of, you know, really when we're talking about uh, whether the OSCE and whether cooperation as we know it uh, is over or better, I would say, yes, only the good die young, but we all know that rock and roll will never die. <laughs> and I think when looking back on the decision to go to Kiev uh, and, and what I had to think on the way there, very long train ride, of what I would tell very vibrant, active, uh, political um, heart of, of, of Ukrainian politics in the parliament, few hundred members, all dressed in, in, uh, in fatigues. Uh, I was there to address a special session, and I said, what added value do I have uh, from one parliament to another beyond the usual rhetoric of we are with you, solidarity, etc." And I said that if I had to look back growing up uh, in a country that looked to Europe for protection of rights, no back backsliding on the rule of law, territorial integrity, and at the end of the day, if something had to happen, there would be somebody to protect us. And I thought that that's the message that the Ukrainians who are fighting for precisely those reasons, for their territorial integrity, for justice, for the protection of rights, and for someone to protect them when things go wrong, I have to say that Europe is not only their home, but it has to open fully its doors to these people. And the message I got back is like, yes, but what next? How are you going to do that? Uh, and I then met with President Zelensky, who had a very significant list of things that was needed by from the European Parliament, in my case specific, uh, um, both on the diplomatic but also logistical financial assistance. But it was also about how are we going to go back to Ukraine after, U after Ukraine wins the war, that was the language that we used, in order for us not only to rebuild it, but for us to visit it 
as a city that is vibrant, that has shared for so many years and has experienced or wants to experience the life with its people, the life that we guarantee. And when we talk about what it means to have more cooperation or how has Russia violated all the conditions that we have taken for granted. So my generation does not know war on our continent. I didn't know when I was elected president a few weeks before Russian invasion that I would be dealing not only with our climate ambitions, our migration challenges, but with a war on our continent. That at the end of the day, when we talk about inter multilateralism, I would look at it as never having been stronger. If I had to think that Nord Stream 2 would be cancelled, if I had to think that we're talking about our environment and energy policy, finally also as a political and security issue, and not only as an environmental policy, when I'm going to look at countries that trigger mechanisms of solidarity that this continent has not seen since the Second World War. And that is because of cooperation, it is because of coordination, and it is because of an understanding that what Russia is doing is unacceptable for everyone. And that not only can we never forget, and as the President said, make sure that we do not go to a world pre-February 24th, thinking that things will be all right when the war is over, and also to make sure that, that organizations such as the OSCE will be able to have the role that they can use to gather evidence of the commission of war crimes on our continent. Last word from my end, we have spent, I've seen the European Union spending decades using legal arguments in order to pretend that there is political will to do something. At the end of the day, when there is political will, you manage, you find agreements, you move forward. We are at that moment. Are we going to grab the momentum to move forward? Or are we going to go in our instinctive position as representatives, not of 500 million citizens, but I'm representing Finland, or I'm going to re I represent um, Latvia, or I'm going to represent a country that does not have a common border with Russia, but that is further away and can therefore exonerate itself from responsibility over a, common over a common challenge. And I think that this is the time where all the rules that Russia has broken, we use that in order for us to reaffirm what unites us against what is unacceptable and should not be forgotten. Thank you, you're right, these are um turbulent times in the, in the sense that the unthinkable becomes thinkable extremely fast these days, both in terms of negative developments as well as in terms of positive developments. Who could have thought two, maybe three months ago that Finland would be joining NATO? Uh, well, one person was talking about it, perhaps before any other Finn was, and that's uh, Mr. Kadainen here on the stage. Uh, got a lot of criticism for it. Um, let me ask you as, as the Finnish representative here on the stage. Um, uh, President Niinistö, last year, I think it was last year, called publicly for the revival of the Helsinki spirit. Finland applied uh, for the position that Poland currently has as chairman of the OSC for 2025, which is the actual 50-year anniversary of the uh, Helsinki meeting of uh, the OSC. Uh, when uh, President Ninista was offering those ideas, he probably had no idea uh, what would come. War came. Um, Jurgi, is the Helsinki spirit dead? And if so, can it be revived? And what is to be done for that to happen? Well, thank you very much for the invitation to this event. Um, Let's put it this way, at least we have a good spirit in Helsinki. <laughs> so as, as we have been talking about music and songs, uh, probably the best song which 
would describe the spirit of Helsing or in Helsinki is euphoria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in 1975, when the spirit of Helsinki was established or launched, there were two ideologically competing uh, uh, blocks. Now it's not anymore like this. Russia is alone. There's not two clocks. So basically one would say that we have a consensus minus one on Helsinki spirit. Even though Russia has destroyed a lot, including the principles of Helsinki spirit, it has shown at the same time its weakness. So when asking whether we still have some principles, I think we have amongst the 56. Many people are asking today whether it was a failure of diplomacy or a failure of OSCE uh, that this war happened, really. I don't think so, because uh, wickedness of individual cannot be removed by law or diplomacy. So we should not um, draw conclusions immediately that all international cooperation should be over. Actually, the EU is stronger, more united than, than for many years. And the NATO is more united and stronger than many years. So there are international cooperation which has wrong word to use in this context, benefited, but at least uh, these organizations have found a basic meaning again. Um, if looking at the concrete work in OSC, uh, which is based on Helsinki principles, actually the security concept it represents is quite modern. Even, even today. It covers military, human rights, environmental and economic issues. So uh, if the organization was established today, I'm pretty sure that the concept would be more or less like the same. Then again, if one participating country, significant one, does not want to subscribe the principles, very principles of the organization anymore, then we are in trouble. Let's imagine the organization without Russia. It would be very, very different. In one hand, it might be much more efficient because uh, Russia would not block or, or use artificial explanation to block things. Um, and it would enable the organization to um, run many concrete projects in the countries where it has projects today. Uh, it would concentrate more on democracy, human rights, environment and economic thinking, but its relevance in security, for instance in arms control, would, would diminish. So. All in all, as 56 participating countries subscribes uh, the principles, it would be pity to throw the organization away. Cooperative security combines two words, cooperation and security. Do we need cooperation? I think yes. Do we need security? I think yes. But right at the moment, it's very difficult to see how the organization can provide its, uh, its work, how it can provide cooperative security, because uh, one significant member doesn't want to, to be part of it. So I don't have an answer where we are by the end of the year. What is the spirit of the organization by the end of the year? Where we are in 2025, when Finland is supposed to take a lead, but and and we don't uh, we don't know um, what happens in Russia, if anything. So, so peace will come 
someday. Before that, I guess there is a ceasefire and there's a need for reconstruction. And there's a need to verify all the crim crimes what have happened in, in Ukraine done by Russians. So we need some organization which is experienced and committed for the principles. So to end here, I say that that the spirit of Helsinki is shared by 56, but but its value today is questionable because uh, it cannot be interpreted in concrete actions. Thank you. I will I will move straight on from not the 56 but the minus one point that you made. Um, Latvia along alongside Estonia, frankly, and also many others. Uh, but certainly Latvia has been a, a hardliner uh, on the concept of appeasing Russia throughout decades. And this is not to be confused with opposition to uh, diplomacy or maintaining open uh, channels of communication. We all have ambassadors in Moscow. Russia has ambassadors in our capitals. We all talk to each other within the United Nations, within the OSC, that's a different topic. But when it comes to actual serious discussions on European security, Latvia has been among those that has been critical uh, of um, appeasement, of uh, false hope. And that was all before the war began. Uh, now, we all obviously value the uh, Helsinki spirit. We all value the uh, core principles of European security, those concepts of sovereignty and territorial integrity upon which everything else uh, was built. Uh, Russia does not. Uh, Lolita, let me ask you, uh, is there any role, in your opinion, uh, for a serious discussion now on European security m with Moscow? Or rephrasing it, what would have to happen for that sort of a discussion with the minus one to become fruitful again? Because mind you, in 1975, we didn't agree, the West didn't agree with Brezhnev Soviet Union, almost anything. Mm. Yeah, it was able to come together and reach a certain level of understanding on certain key, very basic principles. Is it doable today? Under what circumstances would it be doable today? Tell us about this. <laughs> if only I knew. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for, um, for a very complicated question. I think uh, just to try to uh, start to answer on a bit uh, lighter note, I will also quote the song, the continuation actually of uh, the song. And it basically says, if you are too young to die, so basically if you are still alive, uh, you are never too old to rock and roll. So basically, you have to continue, continue, and continue. And uh, this is uh, very much an approach that Latvia has taken uh, to its integration in multilateral formats. Latvia actually never believed that OSCE is enough to guarantee our security. For that reason, we were adamant that we wanted to join uh, European Union to be in the core to adopt all possible policies to integrate every, uh, ourselves in everywhere where we could integrate. We were adamant that we needed to join NATO and so on and so forth. Uh, nevertheless, uh, of course, this cooperative security uh, is not only about the relationship between countries, but it's also about what's happening inside the country. And thinking about Russia, there is going to be Russia after Putin. Mm. And uh, what uh, this Russia is going to be is, of course, a big question. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to forget currently that Russia is not just Kremlin and Putin, that we shouldn't be equating Russia with Kremlin and Putin. Of course, looking at the atrocious conversations that are being intercepted between the Russian soldiers and their family members, we are seeing an atrociously ugly, ugly face of Russia. 
uh, that goes beyond Kremlin, that goes to the regions, that goes to the society of Russia. But what we shouldn't be forgetting is that uh, Russia is also a civil society. It is civil society fighters, human rights defenders, who are still fighting inside Russia. I'm receiving information that there is a whole network of civil society activists that facilitate movement of Ukrainian refugees through Russian territory to the West. I will stop there because this information shouldn't be publicly discussed too much because they will face uh, whatever consequences we can imagine. So basically there is still a vibrant civil society uh, in Russia and they will have to play a role in rebuilding uh, the country or what's going to be left of it. And just to um, uh, talk about this, uh, I will share a personal story. Of course, as we said, uh, we were all shocked by uh, 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 24th February uh, attack on uh, Ukraine announced by the Russian uh, president and immediately executed. And all of us wanted to somehow participate, somehow helped. So for 10 days, I volunteered as a coordinator for Ukrainian refugees who wanted to come to Latvia. I was constantly on the phone trying to guide these people throughout Ukraine, Ukraine as they were trying to reach the Polish border and then uh, put them together with volunteer Latvian drivers who would uh, take them to uh, Latvia. My phone was constantly uh, buzzing, uh, WhatsApp, Telegram, all uh, signal all kinds of applications. And that at that time, I received uh, a phone call from uh, civil society activists, Russian civil society activists, who currently live in Warsaw, and they said that they wanted to talk about healthy federalism in Russia with me in those times. And I thought, oh, give me a break. Healthy federalism in Russia? What do you want to talk about? What is there to talk about? But then I thought, wait a minute. Let's put myself in their shoes. If I was a desperate civil society activist and I reached out to someone in Latvia and I wanted to talk about healthy federalism, if I would get a cold shoulder, if they would say, no, you are from Russia, you are an enemy, I don't want to talk to you, I, where, where else could I turn? So I spoke to them, we sat for an hour. Um, I thought, yeah, yeah, right, healthy federalism. But they had a the concept that Russia is actually developing these regional identities which are opposing Putin. Uh, that, uh, for instance, Bashkir people uh, uh, near ba Baikal are hiding their young people in Mongolia, that uh, there is actually a strong opposition to this war. So it was actually an interesting conversation. Uh, and very interestingly, later on, exactly these same ideas of healthy federalism were mentioned by Mikhail Khodorkovsky on BBC Hard Talk. He also spoke about a new Russia as the only possibility to have a healthy multi-layer uh, diverse governance. Of course, it might be a dream. Uh, we might be, uh, we w might not be too young to die. We might be dead by the time any of this happens. But if that happens, there will have to be someone who will be able to address these concerns and to also institutionally think about it. And this is actually what OSCE has been doing for all those years. As I already said, Many of us never expected it to defend us if we are attacked. But this cooperative security in terms of rule of law, democratic elections, civil society building, uh, gen uh, gender mainstreaming, it is ongoing, it is happening. This is what OSCE is doing. I was myself the head of mission of election observation mission in Mongolia last year. There was very little international pr presence because of COVID in Mongolia. We went, we quarantined ourselves, we observed the elections, and our Mongolian uh, colleagues, a participating state of the OSCE, they really appreciated the presence. And there are many, many examples where actually through this human dimension of security, OSCE is playing a crucial role in terms of addressing concerns of, for instance, uh, women uh, in Kyrgyzstan who are trying to resolve uh, local conflicts, um, in uh, inclusion and training them how to participate in local council campaigns and so and so and so forth. So this is where I see that this organization will have to rock and roll. And of course, when Ukraine wins, it will have to hold elections and we will need a full-fledged, good quality, clever election observation mission. Who will send it? OSCE. So this concludes to uh, my remarks. So, 
things change and even the most stable looking of totalitarian regimes can collapse yes and um, if we are to wait for the minus one to become a plus one again then the question obviously is what is there to be done in the meantime should we can we just put the concept of cooperative dis uh, security of having those discussions with the russia of today on pause can it be done Piotr, you're the think tanker uh, help us figure this out uh, thank you very much jonathan and thank you for inviting me to join this very uh, important interesting conversation i think you know my, my shortest answer would be yes we need to put it on hold. Uh, we need to pose the idea of, of a collective or cooperative uh, security system. And perhaps, you know, my, my very, very blunt answer, um, uh, you could think that I'm, I'm stepping out uh, of the role of think tanker and stepping into the role of, of a pole here on the panel. But, but in fact, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, Poland uh, holds the chairmanship uh, this year in, in the OSCE and one of the major initiatives of, of the Polish government this year at the beginning of February was to launch a uh, renewed European security dialogue which was basically meant exactly to advance the idea of, uh, uh, of what the OSCE is about and what, what the cooperative security system should serve uh, meaning an exchange of, of views and exchange of and, and a dialogue about the future of, of security in Europe. And that was meant to, um, to ease the tensions um, um, and conflict arising ahead of what um, later turned out to be a, a major war on our continent. And, and, uh, and, this, uh, and this initiative, which was uh, a genuine attempt to to advance on this path it was uh, clearly rejected. The war uh, broke out two, year, two, two, two weeks later. So I think we uh, indeed need to think differently about uh, our security, at least for the time being. I'm not saying that we should give up on the idea of, of a cooperative security system altogether, but we, but we really need to put it on hold for, for, for some time. And uh, I think we... Uh, th there is a very interesting, very good report written by another mm, a very famous think tanker, uh, Daniel Hamilton, on, on, on the future of OSCE, where, where under the title Un uh, Uncommon Cause, uh, OSCE as, as, an, as an institution for an uncommon cause, and, and the value of, of this institution is that. But I and it, I, I agree with this title and with the description, the definition, and the very idea of OSCE uh, as, as an institution which which provides this roof, this umbrella for, for countries representing uh, also various interpretations of the principles upon which uh, the, the OEC is funded. But I would argue that uh, the OEC as a, as a cooperative system organization basically uh, has something, there is something um, in common for all participating members, and apart from the principles, which I think are at, at some point, uh, uh, but they are disputable for some of them, as we know very well. But w w when when we look at the very origins of the, of the of the process, we saw first of all the the need to preserve um, the status quo, uh, and we we had also a willingness or at least a declaration that we would resolve conflicts peacefully. And I think we, uh, we know now that uh, neither of that is uh, in place when it comes to, to Russia's approach. And we know that OSCE is about Russia. Uh, and cooperative security system in Europe is about Russia. Because uh, if not Russia, we, we wouldn't have, I think, uh, a need to, 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 to discuss it or to, to talk about it. So, so I think the, we, uh, we, we talked here about the Helsinki spirit. And the Helsinki spirit is b basically about a peaceful conflict resolution and preservation of the status quo. 
And, uh, and now we, of course, need to defend the, the Helsinki spirit and the principles of, of the OSCE, but unfortunately we can and we should defend it with completely different means than a collective uh, security <coughs> system. And I think when I look at, at Jyrki Katainen and, 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 and uh, Finland, I think this is the way to uh, defend the Helsinki spirit. And, and uh, the strengthening of NATO eastern flank is a way to defend the Helsinki spirit. Uh, uh, because uh, um, as we, we have the, the whole group minus one, <laughs> which is subscribing to, the, to these values. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, to, to, to come to the end, I, I think, uh, I think the, the, uh, mm, there is also a, a, dangerous, uh, a danger or a risk in uh, believing that uh, a collective or cooperative security system could be established anytime soon. Uh, I think that it is a risk. We can trap into this illusion and uh, mm, land in a very dangerous place, uh, especially when it comes uh, to the future of, the, uh, of Ukraine and of the, of, of the Russian-Ukraine war. Because this, uh, it, 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 in fact, the, the part of the, of the question is the question about um, the peace settlement or a, a, an end, how this war could end. And, and I think it, it would be dangerous to believe that this war can end with a, a regular peace settlement as we've known it for, for, for from the past. Something which could be uh, monitored by the OSCE, um, uh, and and basically uh, that we could get back not to business as usual, but get back to the Minsk kind of agreement. I think this is completely it's an illusion. So what we should be prepared for is that we are in a very long haul in a confrontation with Russia, and that we may have a uh, a transition solution for the for the Russian Ukrainian war we can have a maybe a ceasefire maybe we, we but it won't be a, a peace settlement as we know it and uh, we will have to uh, basically uh, defend these uh, the, the, the health and principles with completely different means we should not give up on the idea of a cooperative security system but we shouldn't pursue it at the moment uh, uh, mm, uh, at any price, um, and we shouldn't pursue this co uh, uh, cooperative security system, which would have to include Russia, of course, as long as Russia occupies Ukraine, and as long as it threatens uh, Ukraine's existence. And I think uh, probably the third condition is as long Putin's regime is in place, mm. because I don't think it can change uh, mm, uh, that the war can end and the, the threat to Ukraine's existence could cease as long as Putin's regime is in place. So I think uh, mm, uh, these are the, the conditions which, which need to be met uh, if we uh, can, uh, can start thinking again about a collective security system in Europe. Thank you, Piotr. Um, Mike? you have been an official working on European security for decades. And now you're at the OSCE as America's permanent representative. Even if we can, in theory, put cooperative security as a concept on pause, Vienna is certainly not on pause. Things are happening at the OSCE every single day. You're doing something. Uh, I hope you're doing something. <laughs> uh, you're the only one on the panel here who has a, a really a, a front row seat to how the OSC operates. Could you please tell us what could realistically be accomplished either at the OSC or through the OSC or by the OSC that would be significant and positive for European security today and perhaps tomorrow in six months in a year? Yeah, so thank you very much, Jonathan, for inviting me. And I, I guess I am the insider. I was just yesterday at the Permanent Council with the 56 uh, others around the table. Um, I would start by framing things in terms of what are our overarching goals. And I would submit sort of three broad priorities. 
first, supporting a sovereign, democratic, independent Ukraine. Second, um, dealing Russia a strategic failure by degrading its war machine to the extent that Russia will not be able to engage in this sort of aggression again, at least in the near term. And then third, maintaining the defensive strength, unity, and democratic resilience of our allies, but also of our democratic partners. If those are sort of our three overarching aims, then I believe the OSCE does have a role to play, even right now in the current situation with all of the obstacles that we've just discussed and that we face. And so I would say in the first instance, and I was just two months ago in Vilnius at a conference where I was speaking with my good friend, Vladimir Karamursa, who right now is in his 33rd day of detention in Russia for doing nothing other than speaking his mind and expressing his opinion. But Vladimir was telling me, Mike, I believe firmly the OSCE needs to keep Russia in because ever since the 1970s, this is the tool that we have used to hold other participating states accountable for their principles and commitments. Even when we knew, as you said, Yonatan, that in the 1970s, Brezhnev Soviet Union was not abiding by any of its human rights principles and commitments, we still used the conference then on security and cooperation in Europe to hold them accountable. And so that's what we have been doing in the OSCE over the course of the last weeks. We have invoked the Moscow mechanism to deploy a fact-finding mission mm. to Ukraine to look at violations of human rights, violations of international humanitarian law, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. They have come back with a report, an initial report, and I hope there will be more, that has determined that yes, war crimes were committed in Ukraine by Russian forces. And so we need to continue to do that. And I try to do that. And I know my Estonian colleague is here as well. We try to do that every week in the Permanent Council, call out Russia each and every week for the war crimes that we see, for the violations of human rights and for the atrocities. And don't try to gloss it over. Speak truth to the council. So that's number one. Number two, as, um, as has been alluded to already, the OSC is not just a forum or a set of fora where discussion happens. It is also 15 field missions across all of Central Asia, the Western Balkans, Ukraine, where there is now still a limited field mission presence in the Western part of the country, Moldova and elsewhere. And these field missions, they carry out the work that we would want to see in each of these countries in terms of building democratic resilience. They do work on traf countering trafficking in human beings, uh, confronting gender-based violence. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, we've got a field mission with 350 folks that works on election integrity, all kinds of things that we need, frankly, to advance our own interests. We would be cutting off our nose to spite our face if we threw all of this away because we were upset with Russia. This is what we want, and we need to continue to pursue it. And then lastly, I would say the OSCE is a unique body in that we have, we have 10 partners, we have 57 participating states, but not all of those 57 are the same. So we have NATO allies, and NATO is becoming stronger and stronger with every week as it confronts Russia's aggression. But we also have partners that are very worried about their security right now that do not fall under NATO's Article 5 umbrella. I'm thinking of Georgia. I'm thinking of Moldova. I'm thinking of the Central Asian states. And they all speak, at least to me in private, and express their profound concerns about what we're seeing right now. And this is where we can use the OSCE also to engage precisely because we have field missions in many of these countries with 
their governments and with their civil societies to stand with them rather than to leave them at the mercies of the Russian Federation, which has its own programs and its own plans and its own pressure that it applies on these governments for them to work with the CIS or the CSTO or the, Europe the Eurasian Union or the other faux institutions uh, of collective action that Russia has created. And so for all of these reasons, the OSCE is a unique platform that frankly I think we need to preserve in order to advance our interests in contradistinction to Russia, advance our democratic values, support these countries' resilience, and especially support Ukraine. So right now we have a very small field mission, but when we get to a, nego a negotiated resolution, regardless of what that looks like, we will want to invest all of the resources, I mean we collectively, in order to ensure that we have a Ukraine 2.0 that is stronger, more resilient, more democratic, more immune to corruption. And the OSC is not going to be the institution that delivers all of that, but it is one of many players that can make a difference. And so we need to preserve it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment now for you to take the stage. Um, we have microphones around the room. We have about 20 minutes for your questions, comments. Please identify yourself, address the question either to the panel or to a particular panelist. Um, we're all equal in this room except for current and former presidents. So uh, I'll ask President Ilves, uh, whose hand was up first as well, <laughs> to ask the first question. And maybe we'll do this. We'll, we'll, we'll take a few questions. Uh, we're all young enough to rock and roll on stage here. We can remember the question, and then uh, we'll get to the answers. President Ilves. Yeah, well, <clears throat> from the same band, I feel like aqua lung here now. <laughs> but no one even remembers, I'm so old, no one remembers the, ba the album Aqua Lung. I, would, I mean, since you all seem to think the OSC is so wonderful, <laughs> um, <laughs> I will give an alternative. I would argue that basically the OSC has not lost all of its meaning, but its raison d'etre of, especially the word security in it, is completely useless. Look at the history of the CSE and then the OSC. Uh, first of all, it was created in, in 1975 in a co uh, as a Cold War entity to basically fix post-war borders to guarantee that we don't have the we don't see aggression changing borders and the USSR at that time unwittingly and, uh, and, uh, and undervaluing the third basket agreed to the third basket on human rights it was a useful tool then B both the human rights third basket and the uh, border issue have completely lost all meaning in the current situation the 1990 Paris summit of the OSC, where we were, by the way, thrown out, um, was convened so with the Paris Charter that gave every country the right to choose its own security arrangements. Did we even talk about that Paris Charter when Russia was saying, you know, we are invading to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO? No. Where's the OSC? Later, for as Estonia, it was explained by senior people in various countries, including some which are represented here at the, at the uh, this end of the table of the panel, <laughs> that j <laughs> relax, Mr. Minister. It's j it would just think of the OSC as a Russia handling organization, which what that meant in our case and Latvia's case was having a monitoring machine just to keep the Russians happy that we were not violating Russians' human rights. Meanwhile, we had Chechnya going on, right? Okay, so, um, so what possible role does a consensus-based organization with no normative human rights program, none, zero, not possible, uh, and that has in abandoned the inviolability of borders as its fundamental principle do today. Now, I agree it may have a future role, and I'm sure Ambassador Carpenter will not hate me too much when I say, yes, I agree. Like the UN, which was also established for security and the charter says no aggression, no use of force, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think the WHO, the FAO, UNESCO, they have a useful role as far as 
guaranteeing security, neither organization fulfills its fundamental raison d'etre. And so I would say that, yes, the OSC might have a role to play, but in a, I mean, you know, deal with trafficking, fine. But, um, but I think that we are way before 1975 in the current situation. In 1975, you already had detente, you know, you had Nixon and Brezhnev kissing each other and all that. We are in like 1953 right now with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, with security in Europe or in more broadly in the West. Uh, and I think that maybe my, uh, I mean, I know none of you will <laughs> accept this, but nonetheless, maybe mentally we should conceive ourselves as being in 1953, the year of my birth. <laughs> and uh, Stalin is still alive, you know, although I was born after his death. But nonetheless, Stalin's spirit is still alive, and what we, uh, we will hope that in 22 years, uh, whatever, in 2042, we can convene once again in Helsinki um, and have a wonderful sort of beginning of new rules of how to behave in Europe. Thank you. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was a yes or no question. <laughs> uh, we'll, t we'll take a few. Uh, also, breaking news here. There appears to be a link between Stalin's death and Thomas Ilves' birth. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we'll Nine months, exactly. Nine months, exactly. Nine <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, see, suspicious minds. So uh, we'll, we'll, take, we'll start from the left and move to the right. Uh, JJ Green over there. Even though I know you well, you need to introduce yourself. And Thank, then you. We'll <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for such a great panel. Um, and my name's J.J. Green. I'm the National Security Correspondent at WTOP in Washington, D.C. And <clears throat> I heard all of what you said, and I have uh, questions for each of you, but I realize I'm not going to be able to do that, so I'm just going to do one. And the question is very simple and central. Um, not long ago, and this is for the Prime Minister, but anybody feel free, the President of Turkey said today, and I'm sure you all know, you probably have seen it on your phones if somebody's told you okay. that he doesn't think it's a good idea for S Sweden and Finland to join NATO. Just want to know what your thoughts are about that, considering where you are and how political pragmatism may be a bit of a problem right now. Um, as a moderator, I can say things that are not necessarily of m representing of my opinion. The joke that sort of came to mind was that, but at least you're members of the OSC. Um, uh, we'll take two more. Uh, one over there. Thank you. I'm Salome Samadishvili. I'm a member of parliament uh, from Georgia. And uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. But um, as much as you know, we all want to hope that the OSC band performs, whether you know young or old, we are also concerned that uh, I mean, you know, like in any rock and roll band, if you have a drummer that is sabotaging the band, I mean, it's not going to perform under any circumstances. I remember very well uh, when I was Georgia's ambassador to the European Union in 2008, uh, just before the war broke out. One of the things that uh, happened was that the OSC had to close down its mission in Georgia because of the Russian position. And uh, my uh, goal was to convince the European Union to dispatch the mission instead of the OSC mission because the EU was the only place where Russia did not have a seat and therefore could not block the uh, mission, potential mission. Unfortunately, the mission never happened uh, before the war, though after the war, it was uh, promptly sent by the European Union. So my question to all the panelists is, uh, how do you suggest that the OSC, you know, looking towards the future, uh, is more successful given, you know, unless there is some vision on actual reform of the organization because if it continues the way it functions now, at least Georgia was mentioned here by Ambassador Carpenter as somebody who you know, is watching very carefully what are the security, potential security guarantees for our countries. And 
if nothing changes, we already have the experience of the OSC being basically killed off by Russia as far as our country was concerned and our needs were concerned. So what is your suggestion? What's your, what's your vision for the future? Thank you. Okay, we'll have uh, time for a few additional rounds later on, but let's start answering the questions, starting with perhaps uh, President Ilves' yes or no question. And since, Mike, you were the last to address the room before, I'll ask you to be the first one, and then whoever on the panel wants to um, um, pick and choose, obviously the Finland, uh, Sweden, NATO question needs to be addressed, and the political will question. Uh, but Mike, let's start with you. So rationality tells me that it's never wise to get into a debate with President Ilvis, but, um, <laughs> but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, look, one doesn't blame the city for imposing speed rules when you've got someone going 100 miles an hour down a street in a residential neighborhood. You blame the driver, not the speed limit. I think the, the view that you are articulating is roughly the same one that President Reagan articulated back before he was president in the late 70s, where he was extremely critical of the CSCE process. And the line of reasoning back then was we are, by engaging with the Soviets in this dialogue, and particularly with Brezhnev, we are legitimizing the Warsaw Pact and Soviet borders, including here in the Baltic region, and we are getting absolutely nothing in terms of human rights commitments, because let's not kid ourselves, we know the Soviets aren't gonna abide by them. And that, I think, was a legitimate point, a legitimate position to have, only that the same Reagan, by his second term, saw great value in the CSCE process because he realized that he could take those commitments that the Soviets had made, even though they were hortatory and everybody knew they weren't gonna apply them, and, and bang their heads onto those commitments each and every week. And his ambassadors to the CSCE did so very effectively by routinely taking the Soviets to task for their treatment of dissidents, the psychiatric hospitals, and all the rest of it. And so I think we're in a similar position today where, of course, the organization has numerous flaws, not a whole lot of cooperation, not a lot of security when you look at the whole 57. But as I said, if you look at subsets of those 57 and what they are doing together, whether it's the US and the French and Germans and, and maybe Finland supporting the project coordinator in Ukraine or whether it's supporting electoral reform in Bosnia, we're doing good stuff on the ground. Now, it doesn't get the, the same attention that our debates in the Permanent Council get, but that work, I think, is valuable. And so I agree to disagree. Uh, if I could, just one more quick thing on Salome's question on, on Georgia. I agree. Uh, we saw how Russia was able to veto the OSC mission in Georgia. Um, we also saw at the same time that Russia was able to veto the UN mission in Georgia at the same time. Um, does that mean that we walk away from the UN? No. Uh, does the UN need reform? Yes. Does the OSCE need reform? Absolutely. And so to your point, I, and, and actually to President Ilvis's as well, I think what we need to do going forward is think more creatively about how we use, um, it's not the right term, but coalitions of willing states to in, um, undertake projects that we believe in, even if we don't have full consensus. And so we may have to move away for a period of time from a consensual organization to one that operates on something less than consensus. Is that the pause concept, Piotr? Um, you know, on, on the coalition of the willing, uh, or the coalitions of the willing, I, I think uh, it's a tricky thing because uh, the, the, the question, the first question for me is to what extent you can uh, use the resources of the organization which is consensus based uh, for the sake of uh, operations which are not legitimized by one of the key members of the or participating mm, nations. In, in the organization, so it's it's a, a, a this is a practical, uh, 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 a huge practical uh, question. But a, a more fundamental, I think, political question is that 
I could imagine that if uh, there are coalitions of the willing and uh, basically with the aim to isolate Russia or avoid Russia, which is an understandable uh, move and, and uh, the very sense of, of building such coalitions of the willing. So the question is, what will the countries do, for example, in the post-Soviet space? In, in Central Asia, how would they position themselves? Would they uh, basically say, "Okay, so we are we are fine with this concept, and we engage in projects uh, or operations um, um, organized or under the umbrella of uh, OECE, or rather, we are so much afraid of Russia that we stay away, and uh, and then that would be basically the end of the of the organization." Um, I, I would argue, because uh, if you look where OSCE has its um, operations, this is basically, and where, where it really makes difference, I think this is really the Central Asia, this is the Balkans, mm, uh, so th these are the regions where uh, Russia's influence is particularly strong. And then uh, we could uh, we could see basically a, a split of the OSCE with the same result as, as uh, as not doing anything, basically. Uh, but uh, I, I'm so I'm not not, not you know against the the, uh, the the idea of coalitions of the willing, but I think it's it has its uh, limitations, perhaps. Just a, a two finger mic, very quickly, just, just and then very briefly. Um, so so yes, I take your point. There is, however, in the OSCE, a provision for extra budgetary funding of projects. Mm -hmm. So not from the consensual unified budget but precisely from those states who wish to contribute. This has its own pitfalls, and you've identified them, but I just want to point that out. Lolita. Uh, yes, I just wanted to follow up on this point about um, uh, fragility of some regions uh, in OSCE. Uh, for instance, I already mentioned Mongolia, Central Asia, also Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, these are places where, unfortunately, it is possible to be effective at the ground level and civil society level because of uh, this uh, very fact that the, uh, Russia and Belarus are in this organization, specifically Mongolia. And this is an unfortunate, uh, very complex context of uh, the region. And it just, uh, President uh, Ilves' point uh, brought me back uh, to some memories from 99, uh, when I was a young, uh, uh, very energetic journalist fighting against uh, OSCE mission in Latvia exactly while the Chechen war was ongoing and they were telling us how to treat uh, the Russian-speaking minority. And then immediately I went to study in uh, the Central European University and a professor who knew of OSCE successes in Latvia asked me of my experience and I just proclaimed this is the most hated organization in the Baltic. So, as of course, after that, my views have changed, and yeah. I see the nuance. And uh, this is the very nuance of these very fragile uh, regions for, for which we need to be fighting and preserving the context as it is. And uh, to the question of our uh, Georgian colleague about what needs to be changed, of course it needs to be strengthened. But I don't see a potential to do that. Uh, we have to live with, with what we have. In, and in many respects, what we have is already a lot. For instance, when we do election observation, we are happy that there is a Ho Copenhagen document that talks about the human di dimension of security and that actually talks about uh, that states shouldn't be using uh, administrative resources for uh, election purposes. This was already progressive in 99, uh, 99 and, uh, and, and I think we haven't, uh, we haven't been able to have a consensus to uh, really strengthen these documents. So for the time being, we will have to live with whatever we have which is already all right framework, I would say. Uh, Jörg, you can answer yeah. any question, but I you will like have to, to answer the NATO question. Yeah, I, I will answer to the NATO question. So, because I'm not in the government at the moment, so I, I cannot refer any official talks <laughs> between president and ministers. But, um, I, so, so then I, I only need to refer public sources. So. So all the discussions between the president of Finland and, and president of Turkey, for instance, and, and with all the other countries have been positive in a sense that the countries have indicated clearly that they will support our member application. So um, this, is the, this is what has been said in public and also our counterparts, foreign counterparts have indicated this in public. So if there are any other messages, uh, then I, I don't know what they are for. 
But uh, second point, um, uh, as it has been said already, I, I think we should have joined already decades ago. That um, that if Sweden's and and Finland's membership would be somehow connected to to what Russia is saying that they are they don't like, it would indicate clearly that they will they will get through what they have in what they have wanted to get through for instance in OSCE to to set up new uh, spheres of interest so it would be a big back a big backward uh, step for the international community the second point you know is that at the beginning of march many Finns were quite worried or horrified that if there is a situation where Ukraine is negotiating on peace, and and then somebody would say that timing is not right for NATO enlargement. So if it led to the situation that there is a frozen conflict and frozen political situation in NATO too, so it would put NATO to odd situation that it, in one hand it's it's saying that we have open door politics, but in uh, but uh, but on, on the other hand, this cannot been implemented so so unfortunately there's no peace negotiations going on at the moment but um, if NATO or if the two countries couldn't become a NATO family now then when so, so this is the situation Roberta final word perhaps coming in from a different angle about election observation missions and how important um, they are from the perspective, and I refer specifically to to uh, what Salome said, uh, we get accused, and I think correctly, as a European Union, for being unduly harsh for countries that have been waiting for years to enter the European Union, only for us to close an eye on evident backsliding of the fundamental principles that we hold ourselves up for so, um, uh, so proudly uh, once we enter. Uh, and I think uh, this is why we very much value uh, missions that look at how elections are run also in member states of the European Union. Because I think if we were here in the context of not with war, so if I, when I, was, I received the invitation to this conference, this was before 24th February, this would have been probably my main point that let's not forget that in the context of looking where the EU uh, should enlarge or should look to for security, political, and also um, uh, historical, let's say, necessity reasons, let's see that where the failings that we have let um, grow too much within our union uh, have allowed us to close too much of an eye close to home. Uh, the European Parliament is quite strong on this. Uh, for us, the fundamental values remain fundamental whether you're outside or inside the European Union, but let's not uh, allow things to happen in our own backyard simply by blaming those outside um, uh, for reasons that are political or otherwise, at different times of the year or different types of meetings or otherwise, uh, with some kind of you know, legal or political excuses for why we should not reach out and open our union to them. Um. I wanted to do another round of questions, but I can't because mm. I looked at the clock. We have a minute and 20 seconds to go. This has been the beginning. It's certainly not the end of Leonard Mary Conference. Um, this has been the beginning for a serious discussion. It's been less of us here on the stage, but uh, there are 56 of us who still, by their actions, subscribe to the core principles, the Helsinki spirit. Uh, this has been the beginning, not the end, for those discussions amongst the 56 on uh, the future of cooperative security, on the future of uh, the OSC. Um, Mike mentioned the reform of the OSC, uh, of uh, the um, other aspects that the OSC works on besides security, uh, democracy, election uh, monitoring, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, I do hope that, as is often the case, uh, the uh, governments of uh, the free world will follow in the footsteps of think tanks and conferences like this one. And I do hope that we will find the suitable venues for having those discussions amongst ourselves because they are serious. We do need to confront the questions that President Ilbas posed. We need to be not only comfortable with the answers that we provide, but also on the same page with the talking points that we use. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a dinner for uh, some of us I is waiting, for others I'm sure other fun things. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking the outstanding panel we've had today. Thank you.